I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. For billions of years, the Earth has spun through the cosmos, a jewel in the vast expanse of space, teeming with life, a symphony of existence. From the deepest ocean to the highest peaks, from the frozen poles to the scorching deserts, Earth is a tapestry of breathtaking beauty, a delicate balance of life and death. But now the balance is threatened. The world has a water problem. Year after year, we're seeing biblical scale weather events, devastating flooding, terrible landslides, rising temperatures, and endless droughts. And the reason behind it all comes down to water. But what if I told you that there's an answer to all of these problems and it's happening right here in the desert? Where a massive 17,000 hectares of barren, sandy desert mountains have been turned into a vast, lush green oasis. In this video, we're going to discover a technology that's greening the desert. It's so successful that it's making dried out rivers flow with water all year round. And it's all thanks to one woman who's transforming North America's hottest desert, where there is only four to 12 inches of rainfall per year on average. What's even more remarkable is that this technology can even make it rain in the dry season when it doesn't usually rain at all. Scientists are so excited by this that they are conducting tests and the results are proving that this technology could be an all-round solution for the problems that millions of people around the world are battling. And to top it all off, this spectacular solution has actually been inspired by a fluffy creature who is also an important ecosystem engineer. We're regreening the canyons, the mountain, raising the water table, seeing wells that were dry come back, seeing springs that had not flown in years come back. It's successful. To find out how this technology works, we traveled all the way to a remote part of the Sonoran Desert to meet with a woman behind this project. We're en route to a Greening the Desert project in a very remote location. This is an incredibly dry part of the world where it only rains a handful of times during just three months of the year. The Sonoran Desert is the only hot desert in North America, which means it doesn't get cold winters, unlike the other deserts on this continent. Temperatures in this part of the desert can soar to 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius. And its rainfall is mostly during the monsoon season from July to September. A big problem the Sonoran Desert is facing is ongoing drought, which is due to overextraction of water resources for agriculture and cities. And did you know that this desert, like many other deserts all around the world, are steadily being destroyed every time it rains? You would have thought that when it rains, that it would help the desert. But in fact, when it rains, it's often the cause of even bigger problems. Unlike a healthy natural desert ecosystem that looks like this, the desert becomes eroded and looks like this. But why exactly does this happen? If we take a closer look at the desert geography, you will see that there's a lot of canyons and arroyos. Arroyos are dry riverbeds. This is because for most of the year, there is no water at all flowing through these canyons. However, for a very short period after very heavy rain events, they become fast flowing rivers. And because of the abundance of mountains, there are hundreds and thousands of canyons that fill up with water during the short hurricane season. Eventually, all these small rivers come together and become a huge river delta that flows out to sea. This is known as a watershed, but not all watersheds are equal. Some are degraded, and when heavy rain falls on degraded land, it creates gullies and erosion, leaving the landscape even more barren. These huge deltas also dry up and become an arroyo during the dry season. However, it doesn't have to be this way. It's actually possible to make these dry rivers run with water all the time so that they never dry out, even in a hot desert like this. And that's why we're going to be meeting with Florence, 
who's behind the spectacular solution that can actually make this happen. She has spent the last 10 years greening 17,000 hectares of desert. This is all part of a huge regenerative project called Rancho Cacajitas that's been pioneering sustainable agriculture, conservation, and watershed restoration. This project is so big and remote that there's actually no cell signal in many areas of the ranch. As not to get lost, we are meeting up with a head guide called Sebastian and his adorable dog Chaco. We set off across the property and Chaco led the way energetically. En route, Chaco took a quick bath in one of the restored rivers. After a half an hour drive, we finally met up with Florence and we all set off to hike up the canyon riverbed to see the results of the restoration and to find out how it all works. It wasn't long before we were in another world as we traversed over boulders alongside flowing streams. It's really surprising to see that there is water flowing in this canyon even though it hasn't rained for six months. As we climbed higher into the canyon, we found ourselves surrounded by an oasis of green shaded by tons of native palm trees and the soothing sound of running water. The seasonal riverbed of this canyon that's rolling out of this mountain range is where the work has been taking place. The greener foliage along the river path compared to the rest of the landscape is an indication of the increased water presence in the riverbed, which has been achieved by installing special structures that are called gabions. Chaco took a well-earned drink as Florence began to explain to us how they function. My name is Florence Casasius, and I'm in charge of this large watershed management and erosion control work. Here you have one example of a gabion. It's not more than a meter and a half tall above the bed of the stream. A gabion is a structure that looks like two steps constructed across the riverbed. They are not a dam or a rock cement wall or a cement wall. They are a porous structure. That's the important part because as you can see, the water is still flowing all through the height of the gabion. It was amazing to see the water flowing out of the gabion and all the vegetation it was supporting. The idea is that the steps slow the water down and underneath the water is still running but way slower. This is because the water is slowly making its way through the huge amount of sediment that's built up behind the structure. So they're meant to become flat. So all the sand, all the debris, all the organic material, all the seeds, it stays here. It becomes like a flat surface. And this happens completely naturally during the hurricane season. When the hurricane hits and the water starts gushing down, it flows with all the sediment from the decomposition of the granite of the mountain. And so you can see it's a lot of sediment load. With one rainy season, it fills completely the back of the structures. In just one heavy precipitation event, each gabion fills up with that amount of sediment. That's the sponge. These large, dense sediment loads behind the gabions then soak up and hold water as it flows down the canyon. But little did I know I was about to witness something amazing that proves how a project like this can actually make it rain during the dry season. And it's all down to a very interesting way that the gabions work with nature that's even been backed up by science. Researcher Dr. Laura Norman from USGS has conducted scientific tests in southern Arizona on these structures. USGS calls these structures NIDS, Natural Infrastructure in Dryland Streams. The results were that by adding NIDS in that particular watershed, they were able to increase water retention by 28%, reduce flash floods by 50%, and extend the base flow of water by four to five weeks. The structures stored 200 tons of soil per year and sequester carbon comparable to coastal mangrove estuaries. One of the main advantages of creating water retention structures is that they replicate beaver dams by slowing the flow of water so it doesn't just rush out to sea all at once. By slowing the flow of water, it's possible to have water in these arroyos all year round. The gabions, when they're successful, they do that. They add water like year round. Even if it looks just like a trickle of a small stream, there's actually quite a lot of water being stored underground. We got to see what's happening under the surface of the sediment in these holes dug out by wild pigs. The cool thing to see here is the color of the dirt in there. All the debris, all these dead leaves, 
it's organic material that will be a very good fertilizer for the next generation of little plants that we're seeing here. And inside the sediment, the water is protected from the extreme desert heat. The water on the surface will evaporate a lot, but the water underneath the surface won't evaporate as fast. So even when we see a dry gavion, we know that the water is slowly kind of going down and infil infiltrating little by little. Here, because the evaporation, the heat is so intense in the summer, we'd rather have the water below the sand so that it's not a standing water that can evaporate. It's inside the sand, so it keeps cool. When you're in a city and they build these cement canals, they don't absorb. So there's a lot of water being lost by evaporation every single day. So here, it's the other way around. It, it runs underneath. So yes, there is water in the surface, which is amazing because the wildlife loves it. But also there's a ton of water just slowly flowing down into the aquifer, into the wells for the community underneath the ground, underneath what we see. But how does the increased vegetation make it rain more? And how does it make it rain in the dry season when it normally never rains at all? Well, it all comes down to something very important that trees do that scientists have only recently discovered thanks to new research from CERN. Trees, especially on the upper watershed or on the high part of the mountain range, they send molecules in the atmosphere that are good at condensation of the water vapor that is in the clouds. Because one thing is to have clouds and water vapor, but another thing that sometimes is harder is for the vapor to transform into a drop, a water drop that then rains. So the trees have that function for the rain to happen. So obviously that tells us that a deforested mountain range will have a hard time getting rain and the forested healthy mountain range will attract more rain. Here in arid zones, uh, people might not think of it that way, but even more so because we're in arid zone. So more, more trees, more antennas to capture the clouds and the rain. So what's really amazing is that it rained both days while we're here and that doesn't normally happen at this time of year. So is it connected that it should rain during our visit in the month of the year when it never usually rains at all? I mean, it's not a big rain, but there is cloud and there is drops. See the drops. You know, usually the monsoon season is totally a different period during the year. So April and a little bit of rain. So hopefully all this project, the water cycle augmentation, evapotranspirates more with all the extra plants and revegetating, regreening the mountain range. And we'll have more events like that, more cloud formation, more rain. If you're regreening a mountain range, you're also regulating the climate in your area. So people think, oh, climate change, I can't do anything. Thing, but how about you take care of your, you live in that city and you take care of that mountain range, which usually is the main collector of the clouds, right? And you take care of that. Maybe you regulate the wind and the clouds. You're doing something on your microclimate, on your local climate. And if each municipality thinks that way, then you don't have to worry or think like the world, the planet, the climate change. No, do something in your area. 18 gabions have been installed in this riverbed alone. And more than 3,000 gabions have been installed over 17,000 hectares. This has a huge benefit as it's helping to create freshwater wetlands and support riparian vegetation that stabilizes stream and riverbanks, stopping erosion, and the downward spiral of land degradation. This goes to show how important it is to manage our local watersheds. So if you live somewhere that is experiencing problems from drought to flooding or wildfires, consider sharing this video with your community leaders. Maybe installing natural infrastructure in your local dryland stream can make a really big difference. Make sure to check out the other episodes in this series here, where we'll take a look at the Desert Adaptive Farm and learn how to regenerate deserts with cattle and goats. If you found value from this video, consider subscribing and get in touch with us if you have a project you would love us to cover.